Welcome to Writing with Steve with me, Steve Evans. This is the fifth video in a series of videos of writing a story from getting the ideas down all the way to publishing. This video is all about proofreading. So you have your first draft and you're ready to proofread. This video is going to take you step by step through the proofreading process. If you're like me, you found that you're really pleased with some parts of your draft and there's some parts you totally hate. That's perfectly natural. Let's face it, most first drafts are <laughs> Don't worry about it, we've all been there. I'm going to model my approach when I proofread and hopefully you'll find it useful. First major tip is you should print off your draft. To have the hard copy and to work with the hard copy is really useful and it's going to save you valuable time because you're going to pick up lots of mistakes you've made, including typos, only by holding the physical copy. Things that you would miss if you have the copy on your screen. If you've handwritten your manuscript, well, you're ahead of the game. But I would recommend that now you type it up, word process it, because again, it's going to save you lots of valuable time. So first thing I would look at is, are you using concrete words? So what I mean by concrete words is, are you using words that are non-abstract? Words like love, happiness, wickedness, they're all abstract. And what we really need to do is instead of telling your readers that she was happy or she was in love, we need to show them through the writing. For example, instead of saying she is in love, your readers are going to feel very shortchanged if you say that. What you need to do is to show that she's in love and scatter lots of clues that communicate the fact that she is in love, that she is smitten on somebody. I have this paragraph and we're going to work through it and I'm going to show you the changes that I made to it. Every weekday at 5.15pm, she found herself on some errand that took her by the bus stop where he got off after his 12 hour shift at the slaughterhouse. Then, like clockwork, she found herself trailing in his great shadow along the sidewalk to the tenements on 8th Street. She knew he lived at number 16 and had noted that few females visited him except for an old grey lady with a hat like a bouquet. On February the 14th, she had trudged through snow and a blizzard that blistered her lips like a thousand bee kisses, all to sneak to his apartment and furtively slide a postcard under his door. On it was a sunny picture of a tropical beach. She ensured the first side he would see was the one she had garnished with 18 kisses shaped into a huge red heart, nothing more. That night she could not fall to sleep. Her mind was filled with nothing but what he had made of the card. Had he frowned or smiled? Would he have thrown the postcard straight out with the waist or given it his own stamp of approval? Was she sane or insane? This is the revised version of my paragraph and it's still work in progress. But I just want to go through some of the basic changes I made. So one of the first changes I made was to the sentence where she follows the man. I'd actually used the word following. She found herself following in his wake, which is a really good word. But I looked for an alternative and I thought 
trailed or trailing was a much better word that gives or suggests that she's very much under his influence. He's taking the, the lead in the relationship or the potential relationship. It makes her seem quite passive by trailing rather than followed. Also, I changed the word order of the sentence. So my original sentence was, she ensured he would first see the eight kisses and a red heart that she had adorned on one side. By changing the word order, I finished the sentence with heart. This made it a stronger sentence because huge red heart are the last words the reader will read. So as a general rule, place your keywords at the start and at the end of your sentences to make the most impact and use your workhorse words in the middle. And I also replaced the word adorned, which was in the original, to garnished. I used the word garnished because it has a suggestion of preparation and creating and something quite tasty through using that word as well. So I just thought it added an extra dimension and an extra texture to the sentence. Also, when you have the hard copy in your hand, read out the sentences to yourself. Check out the rhythm and also the sound. For example, at first, I used past the bus stop, but changed it to by the bus stop because the sentence sounded better. I was using alliteration, the repetition of B sounds. In scattering clues through her actions, I hoped to present to the readers the, more than a suggestion that she is smitten and in love or perhaps infatuated with this man. Also, I hoped to provide clues of where this story is set. For example, I used words like sidewalk, 8th street and tenements words we would normally associate with the United States. As you proofread, ask yourself, are you using strong nouns and verbs? So for example, I could have said that she placed the postcard under his door, but I used the word slid, which gives a kind of more of a concrete picture of what she's doing and also suggests something that's quite secretive. I tend to ration my use of adverbs, but I did use the word furtively in this paragraph because again, it suggests something that she's doing quietly and secretively and she doesn't want people from the apartments where he lives, discovering her doing this. Also, as I'm proofreading, I'm looking for opportunities to incorporate, to use verbs that are appropriate to the scene and give a little bit more texture and energy to my sentences. For example, she doesn't just walk, she trudges through the blizzard to show her commitment to send him a Valentine's Day postcard. I write 14th of February rather than Valentine's Day because it's an easy clue, but I hope to keep the reader's minds energised and engaged with the story. I also use exaggeration, hyperbole, to emphasise a point. 
So when the blizzard is chapping and blistering her lips, I say it feels like a hundred bee kisses, a hundred bee stings. And I use the word kisses again because it fits into the theme of love and romance and sometimes the pain we endure when we're in love. So as you're proofreading, ask, are there any opportunities that you can keep your readers guessing and curious? For example, I reference the grey lady with a hat like a bouquet. So I want my readers to be puzzled or consider, you know, who is this lady? And is she going to play a major role in the story? So look for those opportunities, particularly ones where your sentence can be doing more than one job. Holding the hard copy will help you decide on whether you need to vary your sentence structure and rhythm. By varying your sentence structure, you can energise your writing, make it more interesting, and a short sentence can add a punch and make a real impact, particularly if it's emphasising a point. For example, I use a short sentence, nothing more, to inform the reader the protagonist didn't leave her name and to signal she had accomplished her mission the deed was done. Use specific details. Give your readers clues and things that they can work with when they are building a world in their imagination. So I was specific in mentioning the job that the man did. And of course there's suggestions and lots of connotations about that type of work which the readers may want to run with. Also I mentioned that the postcard was of a sunny beach scene which again has plenty of suggestions and fits the theme of love and romance. Check are you including any opposite forces, any antagonists. So in my paragraph I'm not using people as opposing forces as such, but I do include a blizzard that is acting as a delaying antagonist in almost preventing the protagonist from reaching her journey and achieving her goal, which is to post the postcard. Also, I'm including the protagonist's own self-doubt as an antagonist, as she worries and frets whether she's done the right thing. So just check whether there are opportunities as you're proofreading to include plenty of mini antagonists. And as I'm proofreading, I'm asking have I included enough opposites to create the tension and the drama to keep our readers interested? And if you're wondering why I'm using words like antagonist and protagonist, uh, please check out our earlier videos. As you proofread, start pruning your passages. Check that every word and every sentence is doing a job. For example, in that short paragraph, in one sentence I use the word knew. She knew he lived at number 16. But then I used noted. Not only am I avoiding repetition of the verb, I also think noted suggests she is sneakily researching him like a private eye. As you're proofreading and you're checking that your words are useful and working for you, do the words you use fit a particular pattern? 
or suggest a particular theme. So looking at the screen where I have the passage, I use the words sneak and furtive in one sentence. And I'm using them because I think they're words that are useful in describing my protagonist and suggest what she's about and what she's doing. Also, do the words suggest a particular genre? Check for cliches and also well-worn similes and metaphors. Although, if your character speaks in cliches, that might be a character trait and may be worth running with. And sometimes, don't be frightened to bend or break the rules. So for example, in my last sentence, I write something that's probably going to lead to my arrest by the writing style guide police. I write in that sentence, his own. And a style guide might say, you don't need to add own. It's redundant because his is already doing that job. However, because I'm using the phrase stamp of approval and his own stamp of approval, and I'm using the pun stamp because he's looking at a postcard, I'm using his own for emphasis, his own approval of the card, his own stamp of approval. So I thought by doing that, it kind of gives emphasis and lends emphasis to the theme. So also look for opportunities to incorporate patterns. So for example, at the end of that paragraph, I used a sequence of questions that built up drama and tension because the protagonist is thinking whether he's going to approve or disapprove of finding that card. Will he be happy or annoyed? Is he going to keep the card or throw it away? And has she made the correct decision in sending him the postcard? By using that sequence of questions, we are helping the reader to share in the protagonist's thought process and therefore engage even more in the paragraph. And keeping the readers curious and want to, to know more about it, by showing what the character, the protagonist is doing in that paragraph, why is she so secretive, why is she so furtive, will make the reader ask lots of questions and that they will want answers to and keep them reading on. Check your paragraph for its structure and each successive paragraph for the structure of the chapter and so on until we look at the entire structure of the story. So for example, even in that short paragraph, I have a structure. To start with, I set up a situation. We seem to have a protagonist who is obsessed and infatuated about a man. Secondly, we introduce a complication and a climax. We introduce the complication of she wants to take it a step further. She has a goal. She wants to post a postcard and we have a climax, which is the posting of the card. Then we have a resolution or an open resolution while she worries about the consequences of her action. Will he be happy? Will he be annoyed? What's going to happen next? So that sets up the next paragraph or further down the line in the chapter and beyond. What's going to happen next? How does he respond? Will he suspect who sent it? How ignorant is he about her feelings for him? 
So what we've done there in that short paragraph is to create a structure which then will drive the story forward. So for example, it leads the reader to ask, how is he going to respond? Does he suspect who's left the postcard? How ignorant is he of her following him? Was she crazy to post the card? We want your readers to ask and to continue to ask what's going to happen next. Of course, this is my first draft and I'm going to work more on it and look for areas of adding drama and tension. So one area I may develop is the scene where she's posting the card and she's looking around. Perhaps I could add the creak of a door from a neighboring apartment or perhaps the echo of footsteps. Perhaps she hears movements from the apartment itself. This all adds to tension and hopefully will keep our readers reading. Also an area for development could be to add more texture to the description. So for example, it's very visual at the moment, but perhaps there's opportunities to include the sounds of the street or perhaps the smells of the streets with car fumes. Again, I don't want to over describe and I don't want to over complicate the description or the story because I don't want to place obstacles in the path of my readers. So sometimes it's a very, very fine balance that you have to find and sometimes it's trial and error. So these are things to consider, but again, when in doubt, leave out because less is always more. So in our next video, we're going to continue with proofreading and we're going to be looking at dialogue, going to be looking at including active sentences and we'll also be looking at including your character's world view. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please subscribe and hit the bell and the like button. Good luck with your proofreading and let me know how you're getting on by dropping me a comment in the box below. Also, check out our earlier videos on writing a story. Don't forget to check out our website, which has lots of great resources for you to download. Until next time, write well.